What if, at the end of the Lord of the Rings, Sauron won? What if, instead of the One Ring being destroyed, it found its way back to the Dark Lord? What if the Fourth Age was Sauron's age? What if he launched war upon all those who opposed him, and what if that war was successful? What would the Age of Sauron look like? Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to another episode of Tolkien Untangled. So today's video is going to be a little bit different. I'm typically pretty allergic to doing what-if videos. You know, the point of this channel is to talk about what Tolkien wrote, not what he might have written if things were different. But the question of what might happen if Sauron won sent me down a rabbit hole which eventually led me to some really interesting conclusions about what Tolkien did write. However, before I can even begin speculating on all of that, there's one enormously important disclaimer that I have to give first. This question, what would happen if Sauron won, does have a short and boring answer, which is, he never could. Iluvatar. I don't want to get too bogged down in something that could be its own video, but Sauron's defeat in The Lord of the Rings, the destruction of his ring in the Cracks of Doom, did not happen by accident. It kind of looks like an accident, you know, Frodo fails ultimately to destroy the ring, it only ends up in the fire due to the treacherous intervention of Gollum. But, as is so often the case, there's much more to it than that. A lot's going on in the moment when Gollum falls into the fire and Sauron suffers his ultimate defeat. Firstly, only a few pages earlier, Frodo held up the One Ring and he effectively used it to curse Gollum, declaring, If you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom. A short while later, and Gollum does touch Frodo again, and then he does fall into the fire. Frodo's curse worked swiftly. Second thing going on, there's the One Ring itself a super treacherous object that's inclined to betray anyone who takes possession of it, including Gollum, as he teeters on the brink of the Cracks of Doom. Ultimately, the ring betrays Gollum to his death, and because of it, the ring ends up falling into the fire and being destroyed, which would not have happened otherwise. This is another example of the self-defeating nature of evil. But by far the most powerful factor at play in this moment, that would be Iluvatar. Right at the beginning of the Silmarillion, Tolkien wrote perhaps the most important sentence in understanding this core theme of his legendarium. Iluvatar, the one, the creator, who devised the music of creation in the timeless halls before the universe was made, he said, right in the beginning, that although many divine beings sang many themes into that song of creation, including Sauron himself, no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite, for he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful that he himself hath not imagined. In other words, Sauron is free to make his own kind of music, everyone is, but in the end, regardless of what anyone intends, all things must prove one of Iluvatar's instruments. And if some beings rebel against Iluvatar, they will end up being instrumental in the devising of their own downfall and the establishing of something far more wonderful than they themselves could ever have imagined. So my point is, Sauron can't win, not in the very end. Such was the design of Iluvatar during the music of creation right at the very beginning before the universe was made. 
However, I do appreciate that that might be a bit of an unsatisfying answer in a video that's over 50 minutes long, and perhaps there is a slightly more creative way to approach this question. Because what I just said there about Iluvatar, though true, does not account for free will. In Tolkien's writings, people make free choices. Those choices have consequences, and consequences affect reality. So what if we could change one of those choices? What if a single person decided differently? And what if the consequences of that were Sauron reclaiming his ring? He has to lose in the end, but that doesn't mean he has to lose in the way he does in The Lord of the Rings. So let's imagine a version of The Lord of the Rings exactly the same as the actual Lord of the Rings by Tolkien, right up until the moment in The Return of the King, when Frodo and Sam briefly part ways on the slopes of Mount Doom. Gollum has revealed himself and tried to take the ring from Frodo, Frodo smacked him down and cursed him with the power of the ring, and he bid farewell to Sam leaving Sam to deal with Gollum, while Frodo climbs upward towards the cracks of doom and the completion of his quest. In the book, Sam turns to Gollum and declares, Now at least I can deal with you. He leaps forward and lifts Sting, ready to do battle, but Gollum does not spring at him. Instead, he falls flat upon the ground and whimpers, begging for his life, begging to be spared just a little longer. For Gollum knows that all is lost, and when Precious is gone, he will die. Die into dust. Now, in this moment, in Tolkien's writings, Sam's hand wavers. His mind is hot with wrath, and it would be just to slay this treacherous, murderous creature many times deserved, and also just like the sensible thing to do, but in spite of all of that, like Frodo before him, and Bilbo before that, Samwise Gamgee chooses pity. He chooses mercy, and because he too has now been a ring bearer, albeit very briefly, he chooses to spare Gollum's life. Which is the choice Iluvatar really needed him to make, but it's not a choice Sam was forced to make. Sam could have chosen otherwise. And what if he did? As many others in his position surely would have. What if Sam chose to play it safe and he killed Gollum on the slopes of Mount Doom? Well, moments later, he would have arrived at the Cracks of Doom, and Frodo would have turned around and told him, the ring is mine. He'd have vanished from Sam's sight, and Sauron would suddenly have become aware of him. The Nazgul would have come faster than the winds hurtling towards Mount Doom, and Gollum would not have shown up to bite Frodo's finger. The Nazgûl would find Frodo in the heart of their master's realm, the one ring upon his finger, and he would not be invisible to them. And we don't even need to speculate on what might have happened next. Tolkien actually tells us. In Letter 246, he wrote that this hypothetical moment of Frodo facing down the eight remaining Nazgûl while wielding the one ring and claiming it as his own might be compared to that of a small brave man armed with a devastating weapon, faced by eight savage warriors of great strength. The man's weakness was that he did not know how to use his weapon yet, and he was by temperament and training averse to violence. Their weakness, that the man's weapon was a thing that filled them with fear as an object of terror in their religious cult. They would have greeted Frodo, as Lord. With fair speeches, they would have induced him to leave the Cracks of Doom, for instance, to look upon his new kingdom. 
once outside the chamber. While he was gazing, some of them would have destroyed the entrance. Frodo would by then probably have been already too enmeshed in great plans, but if he still preserved some sanity and partly understood the significance of it so that he refused now to go with them to Barad-dûr, they would simply have waited until Sauron himself came. A confrontation of Frodo and Sauron was inevitable, and Frodo would have been utterly overthrown, crushed to dust, or preserved in torment as a gibbering slave. So, there you go, Sauron would have won. Frodo would have suffered a fate so nightmarish I don't want to even think about it, and best case scenario for Sam, he dies quickly defending his master from a ring wraith. But what about the rest of Middle-earth? What happens next to them now that Sauron has his ring back? Well, in the very moment Sauron takes the ring from Frodo, most of our other main characters are only about 70 miles northwest of Mount Doom, fighting for their lives in the Battle of the Morannon. And I'm relatively confident that as soon as Sauron got his ring back and recovered a great deal of the strength that he lost 3,000 years ago at the hand of Isildur, he'd have made it known. His armies would have had an enormous surge in morale, and the hosts of the West would suddenly realise they've just lost the War of the Ring. Now, I'm sure some of Aragorn's army would escape to fight another day, maybe Aragorn himself would escape, and they'd probably retreat to Minas Tirith. Maybe there'd be some final battle at Minas Tirith, or maybe the men of the west would retreat, either to Dol Amroth on the coast, or maybe up to Dun Harrow and seek shelter with the Rohirrim. But of course, that is all just speculation. We have no idea of the specifics of how events would unfurl, except that they would unfurl, and that eventually, Aragorn's resistance in Gondor would be broken, and his allies would be either scattered, or killed. And I feel confident suggesting that because in the last debate chapter, Gandalf tells us that if Sauron ever does regain the ring, all of valor is in vain, and his victory will be swift and complete. And so, I'm not going to speculate on the fates of our favorite heroes in this hypothetical version, but regardless of whatever endings you choose to imagine for characters like Aragorn and Eowyn and Eomer and Faramir and Legolas and Gimli, one way or another, by the end of the first century after Sauron reclaimed his ring, either everyone is dead or nearly everyone is dead. Gandalf is, of course, a bit of a wild card here. He's wrapped up in the whole Iluvatar of it all. But Sauron knows who he is, and I imagine hunting the new white wizard would soon become one of his top priorities. If Gandalf could survive the first hundred years of Sauron's retribution, I think he'd have to get far away and keep his head down. However, what interests me more is the bigger picture. It's impossible to say what would happen to any given character in the first century of Sauron's dominion, but what about like 500 years later? Or even a thousand years later? What might Sauron do with his victory once he's achieved it? Well, honestly, I think he'd be a bit of a dick about it. By the time of the Lord of the Rings, Sauron suffered a lot of defeats and experienced quite a bit of ruin. But he's always endured, and he's always risen again, kept going by his malice, and his hatred, and his pride. But now that he's got his ring back, he's undone so many of those defeats, and he's got his chance to go back to being, like, peak Sauron. The Sauron of 4,700 years ago. Except all of that malice he's accumulated along the way, it has to go somewhere. So, I imagine the first thing Sauron would do after destroying any remnant of Aragorn's Dúnedain resistance is consolidate his power and begin the process of bringing all of Middle-earth under his dominion. During Aragorn's confrontation with the mouth of Sauron in The Lord of the Rings, we are told that Sauron would accept his enemy's surrender if 
they agree that all lands east of the Anduin belong to the Dark Lord solely and forever. Now, I'll talk about the lands west of the Anduin in just a second. The idea that Sauron the Deceiver could be trusted to keep his word is ludicrous. But first, all lands east of the Anduin? That's a lot of lands, and a lot of people already living there. On the far edge of the map are the vast eastern lands of Rune, which were, to some extent, already under Sauron's dominion during the Lord of the Rings. Presumably, there were also plenty of people living along and between the rivers Running and Redwater, and of course lots of people in and around the forest of Mirkwood. And Sauron does already have a foothold in that forest. Prior to the Lord of the Rings, he spent thousands of years living in secret in his stronghold of Dol Guldur. And during the Lord of the Rings, many orcs of Dol Guldur make multiple attacks upon multiple different people in that wood. His army causes great harm to the elves of Thranduil's realm, presumably also to the woodmen of Mirkwood, and they even make three separate attacks upon Lothlorien. Now, in the actual version of events, both Celeborn and Thranduil manage to repel their respective orc attacks, and after the One Ring is destroyed, Celeborn leads a great host of Galadhrim to conquer Dol Guldur. Then, his wife Galadriel uses her powers to throw down the walls of Sauron's former stronghold and to cleanse the Hill of Sorcery once and for all. However, in our version of events, the One Ring isn't destroyed, and once it's back in Sauron's possession, we know that Galadriel's ring, along with Elrond's and Gandalf's, will no longer be safe to use. All rings of power are bound to the ruling ring, and the ruling ring is back with its master. The bearers of the three must still protect their rings from Sauron, but they'll no longer be able to use them. Lothlorien will no longer be protected by Nenya's power of preservation. You may disagree, but honestly, I think the most responsible thing Galadriel and Celeborn could do in our version would be to lead their elves far away from their former homes in some sort of mass exodus, maybe bringing them to relative safety either in Rivendell or at the Grey Havens. We can only speculate on what they'd actually do, but with Galadriel unable to use her elvish ring, and with the One Ring back on Sauron's finger, I don't see any version of events where things go well for the elves of Lothlorien. Best case scenario, they all flee Eastern Middle-earth and leave it for Sauron. Worst case scenario, they all die there. And we can make similar-ish speculations about Thranduil's realm and his Sylvan Elves. Maybe they also flee the woodland they've lived in for millennia. Maybe they die fighting for it. Or maybe they hide in the depths of their forest and endure a little longer. But there's no way they can meaningfully resist. And no matter what, after about 500, 600, 700 years, I think almost all lands east of the River Anduin would belong unambiguously to Sauron. Now, there are of course great kingdoms of dwarves and men in this region who are staunch enemies of Sauron, but unfortunately in this version of events I can't find anything optimistic to be said about them. Even in the actual version where Sauron doesn't win, he does still manage to pretty much bring down the allied kingdoms of Dale and the Lonely Mountain. On the same day, Samwise Gamgee rescues Frodo Baggins from the Tower of Kirith Ungol. An immense army of Easterlings loyal to Sauron launch a great attack upon the Manish Kingdom of Dale. Dale is defended by the army of King Brand, that's the grandson of Bard the Bowman, as well as a dwarven army from the Lonely Mountain led by King Dain Ironfoot, cousin of the late Thorin Oakenshield. And this epic union of dwarves and men fight the Easterlings in Dale and before the gate of the Lonely Mountain for three full days. But on the third day, basically, they lose. King Brand of Dale is slain. 
and King Dain Ironfoot dies too, defending the body of his friend and ally. Now, in the real version of events, King Brand and King Dain's sons withstand being besieged within the Lonely Mountain, and they hold out long enough for the ring to be destroyed, and for Sauron to fall, at which point the Easterlings realise they no longer have any incentive to continue this fight, and they are driven back into ruin by the combined armies of the new kings of Dale and the Lonely Mountain. And Tolkien actually tells us, if this union of dwarves and men had been any less badass, and if they hadn't made things so difficult for that great Easterling army, Sauron would have won the War of the Ring regardless of what happened at Pelennor Fields. But if Samwise Gamgee hadn't chosen mercy, if he didn't pity Gollum in the moment it mattered most, the valour of Dale and the Lonely Mountain would have been for nothing. Sauron would have won anyway, the Easterlings would have kept besieging the mountain, and best case scenario, a small coalition of dwarves and men might subsist inside a mountain. A mountain that they know they can't ever leave. And as the centuries pass, these men and dwarves will inherit only a flicker of a memory of a time before Sauron's dominion. No, I think relatively early on in the age after Sauron's victory, all lands east of the Anduin would be, for all intents and purposes, colonies in the Empire of Mordor. But I don't think they'd be empty lands. Sauron's intention isn't to wipe everyone out, it's to make everyone his. So if there are any woodsmen of Mirkwood who are willing to submit to Sauron's dominion and willing to live as slaves under the tyranny of Dol Guldur, I imagine they'd be allowed to remain. And I imagine many Easterlings, whose ancestors had been worshipping Sauron long before his victory, would be rewarded and made local chieftains of these newly acquired lands east of Anduin, and over time many men of Rune would move westward to occupy this part of the world, and there'd probably be quite a distinct caste system here where the descendants of the men who fought for Sauron during the War of the Ring have a much higher status and a much tighter grip on power than the descendants of those woodsmen who'd once been friends of elves and dwarves. And while we're on the topic of dwarves, I do want to make mention of those four dwarven clans who are all known to dwell in the eastern mountains of Rune. We know almost nothing about them or their history, except that they live in lands that have long been under the sway of Sauron, and that some dwarves of these mountains did fight on Sauron's side during the War of the Last Alliance. We also know that four of their kings were given rings of power, and there were four great treasure hoards among them, and that at least half of those rings and hoards were subsequently claimed by dragons. Now, on the one hand, dwarves are typically much harder to corrupt than men are, and I don't think we'd end up with a huge amount of dwarves like enslaved to Sauron's will, but I do still think a great many dwarves would submit to him if he ended up unambiguously victorious. Sauron's skill at crafting, and his alignment with the Valar Aule, the creator of the first dwarves, would, I think, actually make him quite appealing to some dwarves of Rune. Some might see him as a worthy ally and even the supreme ruler of this newly dawned dark fourth age. However, some absolutely would not. I imagine any age-old tensions among these four dwarven clans of the East would surely resurface, and there'd be an enormous amount of conflict. Conflict between those who remember Durin and his fight against Sauron, and those who see Sauron for what he ultimately is, the winner. And honestly, I could see these dwarf wars going on for millennia, just perpetual fighting among the dwarves of Rune, for as long as the Age of Sauron lasts. 
And I should point out, I know I keep saying the Age of Sauron, but Sauron is of course an elvish word, which means the abhorred. Tolkien tells us Sauron does not allow his servants to use that name in his realm, and so after his victory, I imagine, Sauron would start popularising a new name for himself. Unfortunately though, Tolkien never told us what Sauron's actual name was that he called himself, so we can only speculate. Back in the Second Age, while in Numenor, he briefly went by Zigur, which means the Wise One or wizard in the Adonaic language, and of course way back he was known as Myron, the excellent, the admirable, but that's another elvish word. I imagine by now Sauron would want something in the black speech to be his official name among his subjects and his slaves. Anyway, even after a couple of thousand years, I think there would still be some people defying Sauron in the lands east of Anduin. There'd be some hope that Sauron might be vanquished again. And it's certainly possible that deep in some woodland, some isolated islands of resistance do exist in secret, with the Lonely Mountain and maybe Thranduil's halls being the most indomitable. And perhaps some birds and beasts of the wild might unite with Radagast, or some of the Eagles, or the last of the Bayornings, to resist the Dark Lord from the shadows. But they would be in constant conflict with the birds and beasts and men and orcs who worship the Dark Lord. And I think there'd be very little hope of turning the tide. In the East, after about, I don't know, a thousand years, Sauron's power would be, in all the ways that really matter, absolute. But what about the lands west of Anduin? The lands Sauron claimed his enemies would be free to return to if they agreed to surrender. Well, goes without saying, for any men of the West who managed to survive the breaking of Aragorn's resistance in Gondor, there'd be nothing free about their situation whatsoever. In The Lord of the Rings, we're told Sauron's plan for the immediate future is to force the rabble of Gondor and its deluded allies, that's the Dark Lord's words, not mine, to swear oaths to never again challenge Sauron, which I imagine would have to be sworn upon the One Ring, which in the darkness binds them. And then Sauron would have forced all men west of the Anduin, as far as the mountains and the Gap of Rohan, to pay tribute to Mordor. And in addition, they would be used as labour in the rebuilding of Isengard, which would now belong to Sauron and would be ruled by Sauron's trusted lieutenant. When the mouth of Sauron tells this to Gandalf, Gandalf looks into the messenger's eyes and he sees that it'd be the mouth of Sauron himself who would be that master of Isengard, who'd gather all that remained of the West under his sway. He would be their tyrant, and they his slaves. Now, that was the plan if the men of the West surrender. By the time Sauron reclaims his ring in our scenario, the men of the West have made it abundantly clear that they do not surrender. And so I'm relatively confident that whatever becomes of Aragorn's resistance and whatever the fate of the men of the West, Sauron would bring absolute ruin to Gondor, to the kingdom of Isildur, to the lands of the Dúnedain, one of the last legacies of Númenor. With Isengard in the northwest and Mordor in the east and south, the lands of Gondor and Rohan would be pummeled by Sauron's attacks over and over and over. And over and over, there really is no time limit here for Sauron. He has the ring, he's immortal, his enemies mostly are not. He can wage war on the very last vestiges of the men of the west for centuries if he has to. Imagine 700 years of Sauron wielding the one ring constantly harrying both Gondor and Rohan from both Mordor and Isengard. It's certainly possible that refugees from Gondor and Rohan might flee north into the wide open lands of Eriador, but in Gondor and Rohan itself? No, I don't think there's any real hope of meaningful resistance in Gondor six, seven, eight hundred years down the line. 
However, I think it's worth pointing out, for the surviving Haradrim and the Wild Men of Dunland, as well as the Men of Umbar and the Variags of Khand, this might actually be the beginning of a golden age. The lands of their ancestral enemies are now theirs for the taking. They backed the right horse. Suddenly, all those Gondor-hating corsairs in Umbar can sail up the many rivers of Gondor totally unopposed. What we call Gondor may become North Harad, or the colonies of Umbar, and Rohan might become East Dunland. But this golden age could only last so long as the men in these lands are entirely obedient to Sauron, so long as they worship him and live without complaint at the whims of his absolute will. It might be a golden age in terms of, like, territory, but it would not be a golden age for the general well-being of North Harad or East Dunland. However, before I move on to the north of Middle-earth, I want to take a moment to talk about Isengard. Because here we're going to find another interesting wildcard. So, in our version of events, where nothing's different until Sam's decision to spare Gollum on the slopes of Mount Doom, a now victorious Sauron would find Isengard controlled by Ents. In fact, by now, it should technically be known as the Treegarth of Orthanc, and it's a delightful land with gardens of orchards and trees. Unfortunately, I don't think the Ents could hold Treegarth from Sauron for long. Although I do like to imagine the mouth of Sauron riding all the way to Isengard to take up residence in his new tower, but finding when he gets there that the tower now belongs to, and is defended by, Ents. I'd imagine they'd put up a pretty good fight and would be a right nuisance for Sauron and his trusted lieutenant, but the truth is I just don't see how the Treegarth of Orthanc could withstand the fires of Mordor in the long run. Not after a couple of centuries. But the actual wildcard here is Saruman. In Tolkien's story, Treebeard doesn't release Saruman from Orthanc until almost five months after the ring is destroyed. So in our version, who knows? And who knows what Saruman would end up doing in the Age of Sauron? It's a fascinating thing to speculate on, but I don't think anything can be said for certain. I do think Saruman is slippery enough that he could escape the Mouth of Sauron if he were still in Orthanc when the Mouth of Sauron came. Or maybe, with the power of his persuasive voice, Saruman might even be able to manipulate the mouth of Sauron for a time. But Sauron now knows better than to trust him, and Saruman is too proud to be Sauron's captive, so my guess would be that Saruman would slip away from Isengard at some point and disappear north, probably eventually towards the Shire where he knows he has a force of ruffians and at least some half-orcs that are hopefully still loyal to him. And with a few loyal men and a ruthless tendency towards self-preservation, for Saruman there might be some real potential. If he could establish himself as, like, a, a local chieftain in the north, amassing real power there while the eyes of everyone else are on Mordor's war of extermination in Gondor and Rohan, he could have quite some bargaining power when the eyes of Sauron and everybody else finally do turn towards the northwest. What he would do with that bargaining power, I really think, is impossible to say. Probably he would be his own independent third party, but maybe he would try to formally reforge his alliance with Mordor, or maybe he would end up aiding the last of the free peoples, the only ones who might be able to shield him from Sauron's retribution. Mainly because Sauron lives in the southeast, I do imagine the northwest would be the part of Middle-earth that might hold out the longest in this Dark Age of Sauron. That's where the greatest hope of long-term survival lies. It's where Elrond is, it's where Círdan the Shipwright is, it's where I imagine Galadriel and possibly Gandalf would go, it's got dwarves, hobbits, men and elves, and it's a long way from where Sauron currently is. I think if you're living in the Age of Sauron, the safest place you could be, unless you've got some dwarf friends underground in some impenetrable mountain somewhere, would be here, the lands behind the River Loon. 
Back when Sauron was in charge during the Second Age, this was the realm of Gil-galad, a kingdom beyond the Dark Lord's reach. This would surely be a nightmare for Sauron to conquer, and it's an obvious rallying place for any of his enemies that manage to get there. Also, about 600 miles west, in almost a straight line, there's Rivendell, the last homely house maybe anywhere in Middle-earth. You might be thinking, well, Tom Bombadil could eke out a little place of his own to live free of Sauron, and maybe he could for a very long time. But in the Lord of the Rings, we're specifically told, if all else is conquered, Bombadil will fall, last as he was first. I think it would take thousands of years for Sauron to truly conquer every part of Middle-earth, if ever he actually could, but the tiny scattering of places where freedom from Sauron might endure would have to be secret isolated islands floating in an ocean of darkness. But let's say the free people do put up a really good fight, and let's say it takes one and a half thousand years for Sauron to achieve that status quo, an ocean of his dominion with only a few isolated islands of resistance on the far fringes of his empire. That is still only one and a half thousand years. The Third Age lasted over three thousand years. The Second Age lasted almost three and a half thousand years. And the First Age is actually really quite hard to date because we're never told exactly when it began. But we are told it was the longest of the three ages. So it's very reasonable to presume that even as a low end estimate, a hypothetical Age of Sauron could go on at least another thousand years after that point of Sauron achieving near total dominion. So with resistance pretty much stamped out and Middle-earth more or less under his control, then what would Sauron do? How does the rest of the age pan out after one and a half thousand years of fighting? What does Sauron do with his victory? Well, to get into much longer term speculation about Middle-earth two or even three thousand years after Sauron's return to power, I think we need to examine Sauron's personality. I'm sure you're all already aware that throughout the First Age, Sauron was merely a servant of the original Dark Lord, Morgoth. But despite once being on the same side, Morgoth and Sauron do not want the same thing. Morgoth was a lord of discord and defilement and pollution. He wanted to take the world his enemies loved and lived in, and he wanted to ruin it, pervert it, spoil what was good, and annihilate any chance of ever returning to order. In a section of an essay in the history of Middle-earth called Notes on Motives in the Silmarillion, Tolkien wrote, Morgoth was enraged by the mere fact of elves and men's existence, and his sole ultimate object was their destruction. So basically, Morgoth is the worst. He'd rather destroy everything than let elves and men enjoy anything. But Sauron? No, he's not a destroyer at all. First and foremost, fundamentally, he's a creator. In those same notes on motives, Tolkien tells us Sauron had never reached Morgoth's stage of nihilistic madness. He did not object to the existence of the world so long as he could do what he liked with it. He still had the relics of positive purpose that descended from the good of the nature in which he began. It had been his virtue, and therefore also the cause of his fall and of his relapse, that he loved order and coordination and disliked all confusion and wasteful friction. So, in an age of Sauron's dominion, once all meaningful resistance is made meaningless, I think Sauron would really steer into that obsession with order and coordination, and his own twisted sense of perfection. And there really is only one combination of words that's appropriate for what Sauron wanted to become. And it's a combination of words that Tolkien uses to describe this desire in Letter 183. 
he wrote that Sauron desired to be a god king. If victorious, he would have demanded divine honor and absolute temporal power over all. God king. That's what Sauron wants, to be worshipped absolutely. And in the millennia after his hypothetical victory, I think that's what he would be most concerned with, feeling like a god. Throughout The Lord of the Rings and its appendices, it can be really quite striking just how many men Sauron recruits into his armies. I know it's easy to think of orcs as being Sauron's primary servants, and to an extent that is true, but during the Third Age, Sauron convinced Easterlings of Rune, the Balkoth, the Wayne Riders, Variags of Khand, Haradrim of Nia and Far Harad, Corsairs of Umbar, Black Numenorians, Hillmen of Rudawa, and many, many, many more groups of men to fight for Mordor's cause. Sauron doesn't want to destroy the race of men, he wants to deceive them into serving him, into worshipping him as a god king, and into hating his enemies. If he could manipulate the second born children of Iluvatar, aka the race of men, into worshipping him and fearing and hating the firstborn children of Iluvatar, aka the race of elves, well, that would be an almost perfect scenario for Sauron. And it wouldn't be the first time he achieved it. A significant amount of what I've talked about in this hypothetical fourth age of Sauron has actually already happened in the Second Age. Roughly between the year 1695 and 3319 of the Second Age, so a span of 1624 years, Sauron basically did rule Middle-earth throughout a long period that's remembered as the Dark Years. Now, his dominion over Middle-earth wasn't quite complete, the realm of Gil-galad did endure far away in the northwest, Rivendell held out, and there were a couple of secluded sylvan kingdoms in the lands east of Anduin, but for anyone else living even remotely close to Mordor, yeah, Sauron ruled as god-king for over one and a half thousand years, worship by many different nations of men all throughout his vast dominion. And if you know anything about the Second Age history of Numenor, an island far off the coast of Middle-earth, you'll know that Sauron manipulated the men of that land into building great temples and performing ritual human sacrifice under his instruction. Now, in that specific instance, it was more of a deception to get Numenor to self-destruct, which it did, and they were actually worshipping Melkor instead of Sauron. Sauron was simply the high priest of this cult of human sacrifice. But in our hypothetical fourth age, I certainly do believe that vast black temples like the one on Numenor would begin to be built all throughout Middle-earth. And I imagine many of the men and elves and dwarves and birds and beasts that may have resisted Sauron would be slaughtered by Sauron worshippers on the black altars of these temples. It's a dark rabbit hole to go down, but Sauron demonstrated himself enthusiastically capable of this way back in the Second Age. And as the millennia roll on, I think Sauron would become more and more convinced by his own deception. He really is a god king. He's untouchable. All of Middle-earth belongs to him. I can't be certain of this, obviously, but I would speculate at some point after Sauron's return to power, the Lord of the Nazgul, the Witch King, would eventually return. 
I know he was kind of killed on the fields of Pelennor, his unseen sinews were severed from his will, but his will does still exist. It is still bound to Sauron, it's still bound to one of the nine rings given to the race of men, and those nine rings are all safe in Barad-dûr. And so, if Sauron got his ruling ring back, I personally believe it's only a matter of time before the Witch King would be given some new sinews with which to house his will, and he would eventually rise again to serve as Sauron's right hand once more. As I say, that's just speculation, but I do think it's probable. And while we're speculating, maybe Sauron forges some new rings. Maybe he tries to do the second age again, but this time with a greater capacity to actually pull it off. Maybe he reforges all of Middle-earth in his image. Maybe he does get rid of all confusion and wasteful friction. We can only imagine, but maybe. However, there is one thing that I don't think is speculation, one hypothetical event that I am certain would happen. It's kind of the point of this video, and it brings us back to the short and boring answer that I began with. Sauron can't win. Not in the end. Eventually. Given enough time, and given the nature of creation in Tolkien's writings, the age of Sauron's dominion must, one day, come crashing down. Our entire hypothetical spawned from the question, what if Sam Gamgee used his free will to make the wrong decision, and he chose to kill Gollum on the slopes of Mount Doom? If that were the case, a myriad of awful things would unfold, probably a lot of what I talked about in this video. Enormous numbers of people would suffer and die, the quality of life in Middle-earth would plummet, people would feel forced to make all kinds of other wrong and awful decisions, until one day, someone would make a truly right decision. And they probably wouldn't know it as they made it, but because they did make it, the designs of Iluvatar would move towards their fulfilment. There are a million ways it could go, and my theories are as good as yours, but I firmly believe whatever it is that brings an end to the Age of Sauron and sets in motion his subsequent ruin, it will, in some way, be inspired by Sauron's own choices, by his own actions, because in the end, he too must prove but Iluvatar's instrument in the devising of things more wonderful that he himself could never have imagined. Maybe after 3,000 years of Sauron's rule, there might come about some Aragorn-like hero who through a very complex family tree spanning the entire fourth age finds himself the rightful heir of not only the Dúnedain, but also of the Haradrim and of the Easterlings, and maybe this hero would be able to unite all men of Middle-earth to free themselves from Sauron in a union greater than anything the race of men could have achieved if not for the awful age of Sauron that preceded it. Or maybe Saruman might be so humbled at seeing the state of the world that he played a hand in bringing about, that after 3,000 years of living in it, he's finally able to make a change for the better and perhaps seek redemption as, I don't know, Saruman the Grey, a pupil of Gandalf the White. Maybe Saruman's knowledge of the enemy that he acquired during the Lord of the Rings could aid the last of the free people in their resistance, and Saruman could end the Fourth Age as a fully redeemed hero, a powerful force for good that could never have existed if not for the awful Age of Sauron that preceded him. Or maybe, in the end, Sauron's power would be so absolute, and Middle-earth would be so subjugated that Sauron believes himself utterly invulnerable. He abuses all of his slaves and oppresses all of his subjects and is 
absolutely horrendous to everyone he ever encounters. Until one day, he cruelly kicks his most miserable slave one time too many. And just like, for example, Grima Wormtongue did, when Saruman kicked him one time too many in the actual Lord of the Rings, maybe this slave turns on his master. And maybe because Sauron believes himself so invulnerable in the heart of Mordor, he pays no mind to the bitter hatred brewing all around him. And maybe in the end, Mordor falls from within. Maybe the Dark Lord is overthrown by his own miserable slaves. Their resentment of him has grown so strong that they associate the One Ring only with pure evil, and so they have no strong desire that the Ring's able to manipulate except a desire to see it destroyed. Perhaps, eventually, the Land of Sorrow might blossom into somewhere beautiful occupied throughout the Fifth Age by free and happy people, which could never have been the case if not for the awful Age of Sauron that preceded it. Maybe you're not convinced by any of those scenarios and you have your own preferred version of how a hypothetical Age of Sauron might end, but whatever speculatory scenario we conjure, I think all of them should have this common through line. A great victory is achieved by Sauron's enemies in a way that would not have been possible if not for Sauron himself inadvertently making it so. Someone in some place at some time would make some choice to do something right and the consequences of that choice would inspire some act of resistance so great, so mythological, that it sets in motion a chain of events, seemingly by chance, if chance it were, that ultimately brings an end to the Age of Sauron, and the beginning of something wonderful, which could not have been if Sauron hadn't been such a dick if he hadn't so perfectly proven himself to be Iluvatar's thoroughly unwitting instrument in the devising of things more wonderful than Sauron himself could ever have imagined. That's the point of this video. If Gandalf survived this late into the game, which I believe he probably would have, I imagine he would have spent much of this age moving the pieces, nudging the heroes, and engineering Iluvatar's ultimate design from behind the scenes. But whatever scenario we choose to come up with, I think we will always come to this same ending. The darkness will be defeated goodness will overcome, and Sauron must prove himself but Iluvatar's instrument. So, thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to hit like and leave a comment and click subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future videos coming soon. However, until next time, as always, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Navire Melanine. <laughs>